We begin with a question. What more do we need to see, brothers and sisters and young people and friends, to convince us that we're living in the end times? Now that God has brought Brexit to pass, is there something else that we need to see to convince us that Jesus' return is imminent? Do we still carry any lingering doubts? The marvelous events surrounding Brexit should help to dispel any of those doubts. It, it seemed, from the other side of the ocean, to take painstakingly long to arrive. You know, there, there were multiple votes and multiple extensions, inadequate withdrawal agreements, one disappointment after another. Parliament couldn't quite bring themselves to vote for what the people had, uh, or to implement what the people had voted for. Probably because there weren't enough MPs that believed in it themselves. But then in a single day, it was all over. Brexit had a second vote, or rather Britain had a second vote for Brexit as we know. And, uh, and they voted the second time and Brexit was assured once Mr. Johnson had his 80-seat uh, majority. So many ups and downs for that single event, that single prophetic event. To a person unfamiliar with scripture, they wouldn't recognize God's hand in these events. They would only see the, the slow and divisive machinations of the British Parliament, which, by the way, are more efficient than the Parliament or the government that I come from. <laughs> but, but to Bible students familiar with, with Latter-day prophecy, they could see that this was God's revealed will come to pass. Brexit was but one unusual event from man's perspective. For us, it wasn't unusual, but from man's perspective, who would have thought a nation would, would vote to leave the EU? But we now live in a day and age where Brexit is not the only unusual event that we have witnessed in the recent past. The evidence that we are living in the last days and on the brink of Jesus' return is overwhelming. Brother Peter mentioned it this morning. Brother Don will probably mention it in his class. But it is. Very unusual events have taken place. Exactly what the Bible said would happen just prior to, re to the return of Christ. But very unusual from the standpoint that you would never expect these events to take place, but the Bible says, you watch and they will. Who would ever expect a nation to go out of existence for 1900 years and then be reborn? Who would ever expect Jerusalem, after centuries of Gentile domination, again come under Jewish control and under world strife? Who would ever expect democracy, invented by the Greeks in three or 400 BC, whenever it was, to become the people's expectation in the latter days, so that even Mr. Putin has to submit to a democratic vote, not sure how legitimate it is, but he has to show that a majority of the people have elected him. But the Bible said, you watch in the latter days, democracy in the spirit of liberty, equality, and fraternity will become widespread throughout the earth. Who would ever expect Christians to prepare themselves to deny Christ when he returns to the earth? Very unusual circumstance. But Psalm 2 says that's exactly what's going to happen. Who would ever expect European nations to willingly give up their sovereign power to a central authority? What nations ever give up their sovereign authority to a central government? Bible says, you watch, it's going to happen, and we're seeing it take place. Who would ever expect, after millennia upon millennia of homosexuality being recognized as an immoral situation, for that to become a celebrated lifestyle? But the Bible says, you watch, that very unusual circumstance will come to pass just prior to Christ's return. Russia, Germany, and France to form an alliance. Now we saw this uh, born really in 2003, 2004 when the UK and the US invaded the Gulf. For the first time in history, Russia, Germany, and France allied together in opposition to it. We've seen this cool off in the last 10 years, 
But the Bible says you watch in the last days, those three world powers will align. Who would ever expect hostile Arab nations to ally with Israel? But as Brother Peter mentioned, as we'll look at today, that's what Ezekiel 38 says for us to watch for. Who would ever expect believers to challenge creation? 2 Peter 3 says, you watch in the last days. That will develop. And lastly, there will be a surge in travel and a vast increase in knowledge. We can now hold in our hand all of man's knowledge, at least almost all of man's knowledge. And there's no place on earth you cannot buy a ticket for and fly to. Again, a very unusual circumstance, but the Bible says you watch. That unusual circumstance will come to pass. There is no other logical or reasonable explanation for these very unusual and never would have expected them to occur events than to conclude that we are witnessing the very unique set of conditions the Bible foretold would exist in the last days just prior to Christ's return. The other piece we want to make sure we're all in, in aware of, and I, I should mention too, a, a special appeal to the young people. The last six on our list have all come to pass in just the past 15 years, in your lifetime. That's how close we are, and that's God's appeal to us to ready ourselves and be prepared for that day. I have found when it comes to studying Bible prophecy. And today we hope to share with you two or three skills or techniques that I have found helpful over the years. I didn't invent these. I, uh, I learned them from other brethren. But when man writes a story, he typically puts the end of the story at the end of the book. So you have to read through the entire book before you come to the end of the story. That's not how God has written Latter-day Prophecy. God tells us right up front what the end of the story will be. So in Ezekiel 38, that is a picture of what the last days will look like. And God wants us to know the details of that prophecy. Same story in Daniel 2. That image that will be broken by the stone is the end of the story. It's the end of the story in Revelation 16 with the beast and the dragon and the false prophet and the kings of the earth going off to make war in Israel before the battle of Armageddon. And in Daniel 11, the prophecy we're looking at in some detail today is the end of the story. In the end days, God says, you watch, there's going to be a king of the north and a king of the south. But he wants us to know what the end of the story is, so it will encourage us to be watching the signs of the times as we grow ever closer to that, uh, to that end. We begin our review of the uh, king of the south, which is... Uh, the focus of this second class, actually in Ezekiel 38, not in Daniel 11. And we do this because, as we know, Ezekiel 38 has no symbols to decipher. It's fairly straightforward, and it's fairly easy to identify the uh, participants. Brother Peter this morning showed us the uh, perspective of the king of the north power and what he will do. Our focus will be on the uh, alliance of nations called the king of the south in Daniel 11 at the time that uh, Israel is invaded, the alliance of nations with Israel that are friendly towards her. There's three powers noted in verse 13 of Ezekiel 38. There's Sheba and Dedan, there's the merchants of Tarshish and her young lions. And just as Genesis 10 can help us identify who the king of the north or the Gogian power is, Genesis 10 can also help us pinpoint the present-day identification of the King of the South nations, the alliance of nations who are friendly with Israel. So we see that Sheba and Dedan were descendants of Ham back in Genesis 10. We won't take the time to, uh, to read it. And they settled in the east, what today we would call the Arabian Peninsula. There was another set of Sheba and Dedan. We find that in Genesis, uh, in Genesis 25. They were the sons of Keturah. Sorry, and the, uh, sorry, the grandsons of Abraham through Keturah. 
and, and they too settled in what today is referred to as the uh, Arabian Peninsula. So either way, Sheba and Dedan today are those Gulf nations that occupy the present day Sinai uh, or uh, Saudi Peninsula. Tarshish is a little more difficult to understand. And young people, I would appeal to you, if you have not yet ventured into the area of prophecy, this is an excellent study that you can do to root yourself in the historical understanding that our community has regarding Latter-day prophecy. Going back to the days of Brother Thomas, he rightfully identified Tarshish with Britain and her former colonies as being the, uh, and the young lions for good reason. There are numerous characteristics mentioned regarding Tarshish. We're not going to go through the list and look up all the references. We leave it here for your future consideration. And young people, if you're anything like me, you download the YouTube video on the prophecy days and then you can stop it <laughs> and, and spend some time studying and then go back after you've verified what the brother's talking about and then you hit play and away you go. So use these resources because they're valuable. But Tarshish identity with Britain is beyond question. When you, when you go through the, uh, the various aspects, they're a seafaring nation. As we uh, mentioned, they're descended of, uh, of Japheth in Genesis 10. They're a coastal nation in Genesis uh, 10, verse 5. They're a maritime power, according to Isaiah, Isaiah 2, verse 16, and Psalm 48. They traded in global markets. They're renowned for silver, iron, tin, and lead which we know were mined in ancient times in, in Britain. And, and might just pause there to point out that uh, just last September, this is an article from the, uh, from the mail, Global Mail, they, they found a ship, a sunken ship buried in Haifa, just off the coast of Israel. And they dug up the ship and they gleaned the, uh, the booty that was on the ship and they found these silver ingots. And they first took a look at them and they said these silver ingots must have come from Europe. And they looked a bit more and they said, you know, they didn't come from Europe. They came from Cornwall and from Devon 3,000 years ago. And they look at the artifacts in the ship. That's how they know they can date it to 1300 BC, 2300 years ago, I should say. So it's, it's you know, proof that our Heavenly Father has given us in this day and age of a connection between Tarshish and Britain. Herodotus, ancient historian, wrote about the Cassiterides, the Tin Islands. He knew that's what they were called because that's what the Phoenicians called them. He didn't know where they were because the Phoenicians would not disclose their source of tin because it was very lucrative for them. You can see on the map the various um, travel routes that the Phoenicians followed. They would basically leave Tyre on the, the uh, eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, and they would go off to all these ports, made lots of money, made Tyre very famous, as we know from Scripture. But our interest is drawn to the Tin Islands. Again, ancient proof that this is who, uh, this is who Tarshish represents. They are to head a commercial alliance with a family of young lions, Ezekiel 38 points out, as well as Psalm 72. It's a maritime land far west of Israel, we know from Jonah when he got on the ship to go to Tarshish. It's a merchant. It's in Israel in the last days to make money. It's not there to fight a war. And lastly, it's allied to Sheba and Dedan nations from Ezekiel 38. Only Britain ticks all the boxes. And that's why I say if you do this study and you go through and you examine, and you see this is how God has written the Bible. He doesn't give us one chapter on Tarshish. He gives us the evidence and he scatters it throughout Scripture. And then it's our responsibility to take that evidence and accumulate the evidence and get the composite picture of what God is teaching us about Tarshish. A couple of recent events that, you know, just remind us of the important role that Tarshish plays from a financial standpoint. This is called the Global Financial Index from September 2019. 
it evaluates. It's got a series of um, measurements that it used to evaluate the strength of a financial center. London and New York consistently are number one and two in their measurement. And that's exactly what you would expect from the mer merchants of Tarshish. Here's a study that was done last July between the, um, the Royal United Services Institute and the British Britain Israel Communication and Research Center. They got together and said, what should British, the British focus be after Brexit? And not surprisingly, they encouraged a focus in the Middle East. Britain should not, they concluded, disengage from the Middle East. The bilateral trade between the UK and Israel is worth more than eight billion pounds a year. Not surprisingly, the UK is Israel's most significant trading partner under the US. So there is the number one and two Tarshish powers again reflected in the financial arrangements with Israel. And it was also worth noting that they, uh, one of their findings that there are, there are great power shifts occurring in the Middle East. These are not Bible prophecy individuals. These are merchant individuals. The US and European priorities are diverging to a fairly considerable extent over Iran and other issues. We know from a military standpoint that Britain has bases throughout the Middle East that range from Cyprus down to uh, Diego, Diego Garcia. The US also has a heavy presence in the Middle East. Not surprisingly, a predominant number of their bases are among the Sheba and Dedan nations. In fact, as time goes on, you will probably see those bases outside of that area begin to diminish. The first one could be in Afghanistan, depending on how things uh, develop. What else does verse 13 from Ezekiel 38 tell us? Well, Israel's allies question Gog's intent with an air of disbelief, and that's how it's written. What are you doing, Gog, when Gog comes to invade? We know the allies are present in Israel at the time of the invasion. Art thou come? This is one of the reasons, Brother Thomas saw verse 13 and concluded there must be Jews in Israel at the time of the invasion because the Tarshish power, powers and Sheba and Dedan are there in Israel conducting business. And lastly, they recognize that Gog is after two things. He's after the spoil, the silver, the gold, the cattle, and the goods. And he's after a prey. If you look back in chapter 34, at verses 8, 22, and 28, which we won't do, prey there is people. See, the Tarshish and Sheba Dedan nations know that Gog has come not just to make money and take money. Gog has come to kill Jews, but they are powerless to stop him. So we'll turn over to Daniel 11. But before we get there, we'll stop in Daniel 2, because I find the personal character of Daniel in these last two chapters, 11 and 12, is quite remarkable. If you haven't seen this before, it's, uh, it's nothing short of amazing. This, this faithful man is nearly 90 years old. He's probably in the last year of his life. And he mourns, and he fasts, and he chastens himself for three full weeks because he is concerned about his people. We read in verse 2, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. In verse 12, when the angel finally arrives, he recounts to Daniel how he had been delayed, but he now tells, he, he um, recounts the fact that Daniel had chastened himself during that three weeks. Then said he, verse 12, the angel unto me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard and I am come for thy words. You see, Daniel's concern is for his people. 
specifically his people in the latter days. See what verse 14 says? Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. So the visions of chapters 2, 7, and 8, we know all have a latter day application, as Brother Peter reminded us this morning. But so too, the chapters 11 and 12. There's a lot of historical information in chapters 11 and 12, especially chapter 11. But the focus of chapter 11 is on what will happen to Daniel's people in the latter days. That's what Daniel wanted to know. And God will then reveal to Daniel that his people will suffer a time of trouble such as never was, but in the end they will be saved. So at 90 years of age and near death, Daniel still maintained a deep love and concern for his people's spiritual future. Though he had enjoyed a life of pleasure and blessing, having, having lived under a king's guidance just about his whole life, and all of the privileges that came with that. The hope of Israel remained a moral power for good in his life over the flesh right to the end. So when we come to chapter 11 in Daniel, as Brother Peter pointed out this morning, the prophecy of Daniel 11 can be laid down right next to the prophecy of Ezekiel 38 because they are both telling the same end of the story. It's the same two powers, the same two power blocks. There are Israel's enemies, the king of the north, and there are Israel's friends, the king of the south. Daniel 11 adds one more aspect, not evident in Ezekiel 38. There is antagonism that exists between Israel's friends and Israel's enemies in the time of the end. We know that because in Daniel 11, God is using these symbols of the king of the north and the king of the south, which earlier in chapter 11, it was one continuous battle between the two. So Daniel 11 is telling us to look for antagonism in the time of the end. In light of the clear connections between Daniel 11 and Ezekiel 38, if the enemies in Ezekiel 38 are the enemies in Daniel 11. Do you see how it makes sense that the allies in Ezekiel 38 are the same allies in Daniel 11? Israel doesn't end up with a new set of allies in Daniel 11 that she didn't have in Ezekiel 38. So we look for the king of the south power. We look for the identity of the king of the south power back to Ezekiel 38. Because there is the foundation of this latter-day alliance between Israel and these friendly nations. Israel 38 then helps us to define who the, the king of the south is. We need to add Egypt, which Daniel 11 does, because Egypt isn't mentioned in Ezekiel 38. And Libya and Ethiopia are mentioned in Daniel 11. You say, well, why does he mention Libya and Ethiopia? They're mentioned in Ezekiel 38. Well, they're in the south. And you might conclude that Libya and Ethiopia being in the south would be part of the king of the south nations. No, says Daniel, or rather, actually no, says the angel to Daniel. They will be part of the king of the north alliance in the last days. And as Brother Peter pointed out, the path of the northern invader is more developed, more fully developed in Daniel 11. Egypt is the final destination of the king of the north. So to recall what we learned of Israel from Ezekiel 38, her focus in the last days is on commerce. She's very wealthy, so much so that it's part of the reason for the king of the Norse invasion. She has a misplaced trust in herself, in her own strength. God is not part of Israel's national character in the time of the end. And that's what Ezekiel 38 shows us. She has no need for God. No desire to embrace his son. If Christ appeared in Israel today, they would ignore him because they are not ready to embrace him. And ironically, it's their alliance with the king of the south nations that helps Israel to foster 
this misplaced trust in herself. So we look for Britain and her young lions, along with the Sunni Arabs of the Gulf, to be opposed to the king of the north. They can't prevent the invasion, and they don't save Israel when the invasion comes. The king of the south does not provide a counterpunch here in the time of the end. Remember earlier in chapter 11, the king of the north would invade the king of the south, and the king of the south would turn around and invade the king of the north. There is no such counter-invasion that's described in the end days. In fact, the way Daniel 11 is written, the king of the south is quickly eliminated from the arena of war, and Israel is left on her own with none to help. If she is to be saved, it won't be by the king of the south. This is where we want to examine, just in the last five to six years, how God has used the Syrian war to bring about the alliance of the king of the south with Israel. You will recall most of the Shia nations over in the Middle East are Iran and Iraq, some in Syria, some in Lebanon. And there is then the Sunni alliance, part of the king of the south, down in Saudi Arabia and Qatar and Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman, etc. So that, that difference has developed out of religious purposes. But recall that very strange alliance in Ezekiel 38 that says at the time of the end, Israel would be allied with the Sheba Didan, the, the, uh, the, the Sunni Gulf nations. And, and that friendship has only come about in the last 10 years. Because 10 years ago, most Sheba and Didan Arab leaders wouldn't dare infer any friendship with Israel. So what's changed in the last 10 years? And what's changed is what we have witnessed. Again, sometimes these things take a long time to develop. And, and we're not always able to connect the dots. But what's changed is Iran has become a much more powerful nation in the Middle East, partly because of her own influence and partly because of the events that God has orchestrated. In, in 2003, recall, when Mr. Blair and Mr. Bush decided to invade the Middle East, and they specifically were going after Saddam Hussein, and they specifically wanted to take him out of power, which they did. The vacuum that was created when Saddam Hussein was removed from power meant that the Iraqi government would now be replaced with a Shia-based, Iran-friendly government. The firewall that Iraq had presented to Iran to keep them from going westward was now removed. And as a result of that, prophetically speaking, the head of gold from Daniel to Iraq and the chest and arms of silver, Iran, are now Shia-based allies. 20 years ago, they were bitter enemies, but no longer. And this new alliance has enabled Iran to greatly expand her power in the Middle East, threatening not just Israel, but the Sheba, Deden, Arab nations as well. We have a uh, BBC video clip from two years ago. The war was not yet finished then, but I think it helps establish the emergence of Iran and the influence that she has in the, uh, in the region today. If you want to understand what's really going on in the Middle East, you need to look at the forces that are at play behind the scenes. One of the ways of looking at the Middle East is to think of it as a giant chessboard where pieces are constantly manoeuvring around. So who are the losers in all of this and who are the winners? Iran has a huge interest in what's going on in the Arab parts of the Middle East. Iran, of course, is not an Arab country, but it's got a very close ally in Lebanon in the form of Hezbollah and also in the Syrian government of President Bashar al-Assad. Iran came to his aid and helped reverse the imminent defeat that he could well have suffered 
at the hands of the rebels. A lot of the ground that the rebels had taken, they were then beaten back out of by Russian airstrikes, backed by military manpower on the ground, Hezbollah and other Shia forces, often under Iranian command, but working in concert with the Syrians. I think it's too early to say that Syria's President Bashar al-Assad is a winner. He hasn't lost. Iran now has a huge hand in the business, the internal politics and the security apparatuses of Iraq, Syria and Lebanon. And that has essentially given it a corridor of influence all the way from the Afghan border in the east to the Mediterranean in the west. And there's what Daniel 11 expects us to see at the time of the end. Now let me be clear, we are not suggesting Iran is the king of the north. They are Persia in Ezekiel 38. They are part of the king of the north power. But what we are seeing develop out of the Syrian war is this corridor of influence, as the BBC correspondent described it. This is what Iran has been able to develop because they have been successful in supporting the Syrian rebels along with the Russians. So that just like you have to take the nations of Ezekiel 38 and Afghanistan and Pakistan aren't mentioned in Ezekiel 38, but you come to Daniel 11 and you look at the territory of the ancient king of the north and there we see that ba Pakistan and Afghanistan are added to the alliance of nations that will come against Israel. So we see the same uh, developed here. We'll just run through the end of the video to show you who the losers. And that's something that is rattling Saudi Arabia and the Sunni Arab Gulf states to the south. So in all these power struggles and conflicts that are going on in the Middle East, who's losing out? Well, strategically, the Saudis. They may not want to admit it, but they have not come out well out of this big power struggle with Iran. The proxy militias that they have supported in Syria have not done well. They're on the back foot. ISIS, so-called Islamic State, is also a loser. It's lost its caliphate. They made a strategic mistake in 2014 by overreaching themselves. So when the Saudis lost, and Iran emerged as the victors, so to speak, between these two powers, you ask yourself the question, if you were a leader of a Sunni Arab nation, in the Gulf region. And th this is what you've seen in the last few years. You've watched Iran emerge from the Syrian war a winner, having established this corridor of Shia influence. You know that Iran is now supporting the Houthi rebels in Yemen, and they are repeatedly launching Iranian missiles at the Saudi capital. Iran sees itself as a leading Muslim power and would like nothing better than to overthrow the Sunni governments of the Gulf nations. In May 2019, several oil tankers were mysteriously bombed off the coast of the UAE. And in September of last year, there was the major Saudi refinery that was bombed. And the U.S. is a very unreliable ally. Now, just by way of reminder, this is what happened in 2017. That is the U.S. ambassador standing before the Iranian missile that was launched at Riyadh that was shot down before it reached there. In 2019, May of last year, you know there were four tankers, I believe it was, that were bombed just off the, uh, the coast of the UAE. And then that massive refinery fire that happened in uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran's fingerprints were all over these incidents. And the leaders of the Arab nations in the Gulf recognized this. In fact, if you take that picture of the actual attack of the refinery, they found there were approximately 17 points of impact on key infrastructure. Precision bombing, too sophisticated for the Houthis to be able to undertake. And Iran re denied it all. It wasn't us, it wasn't us, it wasn't us. And just a couple of weeks ago, they found a gyroscope that just so happens to be manufactured only in Iran. So if you were a Sunni leader of one of these countries, who would you turn to? Of course, Israel. Not because you were trying to fulfill Bible prophecy, 
Not because some angel visited you at night and said, this is what you must do against your will. Do you see how God is orchestrating these events? He needed Iran to emerge from the Syrian war in a much stronger position. And so they did. And as the Saudis were supporting the Syrian rebels, hoping the rebels would overthrow Mr. Assad, they were unsuccessful. And as a result, this very unusual alliance makes perfect sense. If you are a Saudi or if you are a, uh, us, an Arab leader among the Sunni uh, nations. One additional video just to uh, supplement this. The growing alliance between Gulf monarchies and Israel is one of Middle East's most notorious open secrets. Monarchies in the Persian Gulf have long claimed to support the Palestinian struggle while secretly working with U.S. and Israel behind the scenes. Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Qatar have at various times tried to exploit the Palestinian struggle for their own political interests, but in recent years their collaboration with Israel has become more prominent and overt. The war in Syria has brought Gulf regimes and Israel even closer together with both sides supporting anti-government, anti-Iran rebels, including Syria's Al-Qaeda affiliate Al-Nusra Front. In 2017, an Israeli cabinet member admitted that Israeli government collaborates with Saudi Arabia in order to counter the growing influence of Iran. The Israeli's intelligence affairs minister even invited Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to visit Israel. These Gulf regimes, like Israel, are key allies and proxies of the United States in the region. They have been for a long time. The Bush era compounded the alliances and the election of President Donald Trump has only accelerated these growing relations. There were even reports that Saudi Arabia and Egypt gave Trump the green light to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. And Bahrain likewise normalized Trump's move by promptly sending a delegation to Jerusalem. There's ample evidence in the current events that are, uh, are coming out now, this growing alliance between Israel and the uh, Sheba Didan nations. And the Sheba, Sheba Didan nations are becoming more prominent in their acknowledgement that they, uh, they have this alliance with Israel. We just have one additional current event to, uh, to show you on this. This was just last week when King Salman, now this is not the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, this is the king himself. He hosts a rabbi in his official residence. Never been done before. This rabbi is an Israeli citizen. And the Jerusalem Report, uh, the, the Jerusalem Report article uh, stated that the king tells the group of leaders from five religions that Saudi Arabia is returning to the area, to the era of Islamic openness of earlier ages. What he doesn't say is we are looking for Israel to help protect us. Because they saw last September how vulnerable they were to attacks by the Iranians who would like nothing better than to uh, inflict damage upon the Saudis. Now this is one of those times we're going to share with you something that I have found helpful in studying prophecy. But we'll pause for just a moment to note what I, uh, what I call a literary phenomenon that is only found in the Bible. It, it's really a marvel of God's word, and it proves unquestionably that only God could have written these prophecies. And it's a literary technique that I refer to as the replication principle. It's fairly simple to understand, yet it's very helpful in understanding Latter-day prophecy. Here's how it works. God says, do you see that map and those dual powers and the territory they governed in 300 B.C.? Those same conditions will also exist. They will be replicated at the time of the end. There will be a latter-day king of the north and a latter-day king of the south, and they will control the same territory as the ancient kings of the north and the south. And there will be the same antagonism that will exist between them. 
And in the latter day, the king of the north will invade the king of the south, just like during the Grecian Empire. And Israel will again suffer as a result of the king of the north's invasion, just as it did in the past. You see, God is able to use historical situations to describe what will happen in the latter days. And he knows he can do this because there will be parallel conditions that exist. The same situation that existed 2,300 years ago will also exist in the latter days. It's not the same men. It's not the same soldiers. It's not the same generals. It's not even the same race of people. They have long since passed from the scene. But it will be the same territories and the same geographical powers as Brother Thomas writes about. It's not races, it's territories, it's powers that these latter-day prophecies deal with. The replication principle isn't just found here in Daniel 11 concerning the king of the north and the king of the south. It's also true of the four beasts of Daniel 7. It's true of the little horn of Daniel 7. It's true of the little horn of the goat of Daniel 8. And the king of fierce countenance in chapter 8. It's true of the willful king and the strange God in chapter 11. And it's true of the dragons and the beasts in Revelation 13. Each of these Latter-day symbols have both an ancient and historical application, and they have a Latter-day application. You see, only God could write prophecy where he goes back into history and he says, do you see those historical conditions? Well, they will be replicated at the time of the end, so watch for these latter-day powers governing these latter-day territories. It's incredible that God could script these events covering two time periods that are separated by centuries or, in some cases, millennia, knowing that the two powers would share identical characteristics and participate in identical events. It's a marvel of God's word, an incredible testimony to his authorship of the Bible. Man could never, ever duplicate this literary technique. So we make another a special appeal to the young people who may hear of challenges from within the community to the accuracy of God's prophetic word, or is Jesus really coming back to the earth? This is unexplainable inexplainable unless it's recognized to be the hand of God in writing these prophecies and telling us what to watch for. This is another time we need to put the pieces together and you'll hear that a couple times uh, this afternoon. God has given us all of these pieces of prophecy scattered throughout scripture. He says now I want you to take the pieces and put them together to see the composite picture. So the kingdom of men in its final phase will begin with the Babylonian Empire. So recognize the territory covered there. And then add to that the Persian Empire and the territory covered there. And then add to that the Greek Empire and the territory covered there. And then add to that the Roman Empire and the territory covered there. And he says, don't think of Greece today, which is you know, going from bankruptcy to bankruptcy, or Italy, which is not a major power, Think of the territories in the past. Those are the territories that will be united at the time of the end. And then to these territories, we have the information from Ezekiel 38, and from Joel 3, and from Micah 4, and from Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. And what we end up with is a composite picture. Here are the, is the great latter-day adversary of Israel, the kingdom of men at the zenith of its power. That is what's being built. The king of the north is one piece of this. The king of the south, you'll notice, is not part of this because they are allied with Israel and they are excluded from this alliance. It's all the pieces put together. When you look at the population of Israel today at about 8.5 million against countries that total almost 1.2 billion people, I'm not suggesting they will all be soldiers, but you see the enormity of what will exist in the last days. As Brother Thomas wrote, Babylon then, at the crisis of its fall, and he equates Babylon with the, the latter-day adversary of Israel, will have attained its most ample development. It will extend from the Atlantic Ocean on the west along the northern confines of China to, to the Pacific Ocean eastward, including Turkey, Persia, and independent Tartary, which is Eastern Asia. 
and includes the ancient Chaldea and Persia, the bare feet of the Babylonish, Babylonish beast of the sea. On the north, it will stretch from the Arctic Ocean to the Atlas Mountains and cataracts of the Nile and beyond. Southward, including the Roman Africa, Egypt, and Abyssinia, or Ethiopia. From these countries overflowed by the king of the north, the armies of Babylon the Great are to be gathered for the war of that great day of God Almighty. It will be a devastating time for Israel, is how the scriptures portray it. This is what we've been looking at today with the invasion of the king of the north against the king of the south. Daniel 2 says the form thereof was terrible, a fourth beast dreadful and terrible, great and terrible day of Yahweh, severe abuse in Joel 3 of the Jewish children, two-thirds of the Jews will be cut off, Zechariah 13 verse 9 says, and Jerusalem will be taken and the women ravished, and one half of the city will go into captivity. That's the picture portrayed of Israel, because they are not ready today to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one additional aspect we don't want to miss when we go through Daniel 11. You know how in verses 36 to 39, it talks about this willful king, the Roman Empire that arises after the wars between the king of the north and the king of the south. And then this willful king gets a, an ally, a partner, called a strange god with his strange religion, that strange religion that promotes celibacy. And then they, have, they worship dead saints who protect their buildings that they, they worship in. You see, the strange god doesn't go away in verse 40. Just like the willful king doesn't go away in verse 40. The willful king we know continues right to the end. Because in verse 36 it says he will continue till the end of God's indignation against his people. And his brother Thomas rightfully pointed out that willful king is there at the time of the end. We see that alliance he made with a strange God, that doesn't go away in verse 40 either. It just isn't talked about in these verses. It's the same alliance that we see with the little horn of the fourth beast. It's the same alliance that we see with the false prophet in Revelation 16. So the strange God doesn't go away in verse 40. There will be a military, a political aspect of the king of the north, and there will be a religious aspect as well. And the strange God, you see, his role will be to provide moral cover for the millions of Jews that will die when the king of the north invades. This is the right thing to do. Will the strange God, also known as the little horn of the beast, also known as the man of sin, also known as the false prophet, he will provide the moral cover to this invasion. And he will claim it is God's will and he will sanctify what we know will be an atrocity. And, and do you see how far apart the spirit of Daniel is from the spirit of the man of sin in that day? Daniel was mourning and fasting and chastening himself because he cared for his people in the last day. And the man of sin will be at the other end of the spectrum. And you can see why God is angry with the nations in that day. I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury. The Lord cometh with fire in his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. And the slain of the Lord will be many. I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. They will come and they will slay millions of Jews in the name of God supposedly with God's blessing, claiming it is God's will. And the strange God will be right there condoning and blessing it all and providing the moral cover for their catastrophically evil and ungodly actions. Is there any more reprehensible action than to kill God's people and yet claim to be doing God's will? This is again where we put two pieces together. The Daniel 11 and 12 piece together with the Zechariah 12 and 13 piece. In Egypt, we know the story. Brother Peter took us through the story. The king of the north comes down, devastates Israel, goes down into Egypt. Two-thirds in Israel will already be slain. He will have by peace destroyed many, as we saw earlier. Driven by his anti-Semitism, he will then, in Egypt, 
decide to return to Israel. Because, as Brother Peter reminded us, he will hear tidings. Out of the east and the north, those, would, those tidings would come from Christ and the saints. And he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. He has already killed two-thirds of the Jews. And now he returns to kill the final third. But this final third is different. This final third has been called by God. Romans 8, 28, and 29. This final third will go into the kingdom. This final third will be baptized and put on the saving, saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The king of the north will not be able to touch this final third. It's not a case of luck, brethren and sisters, or chance. It's not by luck that the two-thirds died and the one-third survived. I don't know how God will differentiate them. But the one-third who survive will be spared in that day when the king of the north goes forth a second time to kill Jews. And this time Christ and the saints will intervene and they will save them. There's no way he could be successful, the king of the north could, because Michael the great prince will arise related to the resurrection in verse 2 of chapter 12 and save the Jews who have been called they will still need to go through the conversion process. In chapter 12 and 13 of Zechariah, they don't know who their savior is. It's a, it's a wonderful story. They've been saved by the king of the north the second time, and they don't know who their savior is, and Christ reveals himself to them. And there's national mourning that breaks out. Chapter 13 describes what I think is the baptism of the Jews in those days. Jeremiah 31 to 33 talks about the covenant that they will make with the Lord Jesus Christ. They will put on the saving name of Christ and make a decision in their life to become lifelong servants of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful story. But it is all brought about because of the horrendous events that are about to be unleashed in Israel by the king of the north. But God, as he does, oftentimes in scripture, will use all that evil brought on by the invading nations, to in the end save his people. Only our God could accomplish such a wonderful outcome to such an horrific display of evil. The story of Tarshish doesn't end in Daniel 11. It doesn't end with the destruction of the king of the north. There are marvelous events that unfold once Christ is in the earth. And again, these are events that only God could achieve. Now, we're going to have to use a few brain cells. We're going to put some verses together. So, you know, make sure you have your Bible available. I hope the light is sufficient. But we're going to construct some verses because this is how God has written it. He doesn't give us one chapter on what happens to Tarshish after Christ is back in the land. He gives us pieces that we have to identify and put together. We know what happens to Tarshish before the return of Christ. There's Successful merchants, along with her young lions in the Middle East, they're making money and helping Israel do the same. When the king of the north invades, Tarshish and her young lions are no match for his overwhelming strength. You see, Tarshish isn't ready for the kingdom at Christ's return. She isn't ready to just walk into the kingdom. She must first be humbled. God can't use a proud and arrogant nation. He can't use a proud and arrogant Tarshish, but he can use a humbled Tarshish. And to achieve that, he will take away the source of her pride, her merchanting and her ships. So Isaiah 2 describes, if we could turn there, please. It describes how God will humble Tarshish in that day. Verse 11 sets the context of God humbling man. It says, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Verse 12, for the day of the Lord of hosts, this is now the kingdom, shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And upon all the ships of Tarshish, now we jump down to verse 16, all the ships of Tarshish and upon all the pleasant pictures, that which man glories in. 
And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Tarshish is not already converted when Christ returns, so she must go through her own conversion process. We jump over to uh, Psalm 48. We see the same story. In verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 48, it's clearly a picture of the kingdom. And the context is Zion being a joy in the earth. Great is the Lord, verse, Psalm 48, verse 1 says, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Verses 4 to 6 then describe how the rulers in that day will be in fear before the Lord as a woman in travail. But our focus is verse 7. Thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. That which made her great, which brought her wealth and prestige, the source of her pride, will be brought low. Now, whether God breaks the ships using the king of the north or he does it angelically is not clear. But what is clear is that Tarshish has been greatly humbled on the day when Zion is exalted. Now, how does Tarshish respond? To that humbling. In a word, fantastically. Turn over to Isaiah 60. The scriptures are clear that it's a spiritual response on the part of Tarshish to her humbling. Look what verse 60, Isaiah 60 says of her response. And we first need to recognize in Isaiah 60. There's a the, a the, a the, a the. In verse 14, we learn the identity of the. The identity of the is Zion. The sons also of them that officiated, sorry, that afflicted thee, shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despised thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. You see, the chapter opens, so we now know who the V is. Go back to verse 1. The chapter opens before Christ's return. The world is dwelling in darkness, but light comes to Zion. Arise, verse 1, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness, it's the spiritual ignorance of the nations, shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, Zion, and his glory shall be seen in thee. The nations don't remain in darkness, as we know. And they come to the light of Zion. So in verse, thir in verse 3, And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. So the Gentile nations are undergoing a conversion. They're embracing the light of the gospel that emanates from Zion. Christ is establishing the kingdom, and he's inviting the Gentile nations to submit and to cooperate to his, with his will. The Jews, in verse 4, who have been living abroad, are now returning. Lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. They come to thee, thy son shall come from Avar, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side, or carried on the hip, as the ESV has. Verse 6 states that Sheba is among the nations that are converted. The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. Verse 9 describes how Tarshish responds. Surely the isles shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel because he hath glorified thee, Zion. Now who is the me that the, that the nations wait for? That's God. And we know that because verse 7 speaks of how Kedar and the Baal should come to the temple. They shall come up with accept, acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. So recognize that Tarshish and the Isle nations are trusting in God. That phrase, they shall wait for me, that's the same phrase that we see in the Psalms. Those that wait upon the Lord. They are waiting upon God in faith. And what is it that they do by faith in their waiting? The answer is, they bring Jews back to Israel. Because it says in verse 9, they will bring thy sons from afar. 
So see the faith in the first part of verse 9 and see the works of obedience springing from the faith in the second part of verse 9. Now I know you don't find the word faith and works in this verse, but that's what's being described. This is Tarshish's response to this situation. It's not a forced tribute. And notice they are bringing the Jews to the name of the Lord. That's not just thrown in there. The name of the Lord, they understand God's name and God's purpose. And they want to be part of that purpose. That's what verse 9 is telling us. This nation of Tarshish, who by faith is waiting upon the Lord, and now they bring Jews to him. It's not a forced tribute they bring. Their silver and their gold and the people they bring is a willing offering. So do you see how verse 9 portrays the spiritual outlook of Tarshish? Not just her eagerness to be first. This is a converted people who have submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is now establishing the kingdom. And one of the first things he does is issues a call for the Jews to be brought home. And Tarshish is among the first to submit to, to Christ and to cooperate with him. It's evident that not all her ships were destroyed because her ships are used. Whether or not any of her ships were destroyed, and that was just a metaphor for God humbling her, we're not certain. But we are certain that Tarshish will use her ships to bring Jews to Zion by faith, cooperating with the Lord Jesus Christ, and they will do it willingly because they want to be part of God's future purpose. Isn't that a lovely picture of what God is able to accomplish in this Gentile nation. Psalm 72 tells the same story. We'll just mention verse 10 for lack of time. We'll also skip by Isaiah 66. We need to finish. We're going to quickly go through Isaiah 18. It's poetic language, so you won't find Tarshish, but you will find the same story. The Jews are brought to Zion, and verse 7 is a gift to God. It's the same prophecy that we saw in Isaiah 60. The Jews outside of Israel are described as a nation scattered and peeled, smooth due to the heavy labor, is what Briggs driver Brown says. Their land was invaded and spoiled by invaders. And the key to understanding Isaiah 18 is to recognize the last three verses of chapter 17 are the invasion of the king of the north. They come like a tsunami. And God saves Israel. In Daniel 11, they came like a whirlwind. Here they come like a tsunami, like a raging river. And God delivers Israel. And in chapter 18, the first thing that then happens is a call goes out to a nation shadowing of wings, shadowing with wings. The nation who will bring this scattered and peeled, downtrodden people back to Israel. This nation that is so far away, it's beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. What's unusual about this nation is that they have many ships. When you look in verse, uh, verse 1 and 2 of Isaiah 18, They come with many ships of bulrushes, and the command goes out to send their ambassadors to bring Jews back to Israel. And they respond to that call. They bring the Jews back, and there is great joy in Zion. We know it's Christ that issues the command, because in verse 3, he's called the ensign. So chapter 18 provides the similar story that we saw in the other chapters. God begins with a proud nation whose people are of no use. He breaks the ships of Tarshish, the source of their pride. They humbly submit to him. It's a wonderfully orchestrated outcome. The very ships that caused the pride of, of Tarshish are now put into a service. Tarshish will not be hired servants, but willing servants, and they will not only know the everlasting gospel of Revelation 14, but they will be in complete agreement with it. And you see, brethren and sisters and young people, why Britain had to come out of the EU. God could never have established, he could never have accomplished what he will accomplish with Tarshish if she was still a member of the EU. Britain is on a different prophetic trajectory than Europe. 
Prior to Christ's return, she is aligned with the young lions, and Sheba and Dedan, Europe, is aligned with the king of the north, with Russia and Iran. At Christ's return, they are on opposing sides. After Christ's return, they will both be humble, but respond to their humbling in two different ways. Britain will submit to Christ and cooperate with him. Europe will reject Christ's rule. They will reject the everlasting gospel. They will reject the Jews being God's people. And they will actually make war against the Lamb as he is attempting to establish the kingdom of God. Two different, completely prophetic trajectories. They are also on two completely different spiritual trajectories. So what we saw in Brexit is not only was Britain freed from the shackles of the EU, but she, Brexit now marks the beginning of the eventual conversion of Tarshish. They couldn't have been converted having been members of the EU, but they can now be, now that they're separated. So what of ourselves, brethren and sisters, and young people and friends? What spiritual trajectory are we on? We examine these things, hopefully they will prick our hearts and remind us of just how close to the return of Christ that we are. May they prick our hearts and our consciences and cause us to examine our walk, to make the changes we need to make, to ensure that the trajectory of our life is towards Zion.